This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. September 7th, 1993, New York City. Firefighters were called to this apartment building in the Bronx. Smoke billowed from a second floor window. They broke down the door and made a horrifying discovery. The first officer, New York City firefighter, who you'd think had seen it all, was looking for the source of the fire and discovers a smoldering torso in a bathtub. The burning body was drained of blood. The head and hands had been hacked off and were nowhere to be found. It would turn out to be the work of the Latin Kings against one of their own. A Latin King learns that your worst enemy is a Latin King. The New York City Latin Kings. On the surface, they were a family. We stick together. I would die for my brother's right here. Beneath that, a violent gang that turned the city into a war zone. That was like Lord of the Flies with automatic weapons. I started stabbing people for the fun of it. Bodies being dismembered, their bodies being burned. It sends a message. We're not going to be messed with. Their reign of terror reached inward. The Latin Kings were full of it wasn't about a brotherhood. As behind the scenes, one criminal mastermind pulled the strings. He turned out to be one of the most ruthless and bloodthirsty killers that history will ever know. Escape was not an option. King's a king for life. He dies under those colors. We go deep inside this dysfunctional family with never before seen footage, taking a rare look into their violent world. In the street, sometimes you get away with murder. The streets of New York City. Throughout history, it has been home to some of the toughest and most violent gangs in the world. Where wearing the wrong colors or throwing the wrong sign can be a death sentence. It's here that the New York chapter of the Latin Kings has flourished for over 20 years. It was born out of the need for protection behind bars at New York's toughest prisons. But now, the Latin Kings are on the streets and 5,000 strong. A number that surprises even some cops. It just took off like wildfire, and quite frankly, we weren't prepared for it. The gang calls itself the nation and has adopted the battle cry, Amor de Rey. It's this dual promise, the love of a family and the loyalty of an army that is so seductive for many in New York's poorest neighborhoods. Black and gold, and pigs love black, black and gold, gold. whose house, King's house. These current day Latin Kings agree to speak with us about life inside one of the most violent gangs in America. They give us a rare glimpse into the nation. If any more want to come and pop on us, you know where we'll be at. Don't say behind closed doors. Say to our face, all right? I'm on the rate. I'm on the rate. They openly taunt rival gangs, but they ask that their faces be concealed, mainly to protect them from their own. Their fear is real. As with most gangs, they will be hunted down and killed for breaking their code of silence. But the threat of death doesn't deter these gangbangers. They openly talk about the nation with the fervor of religion. Yeah, I don't believe in God. God ain't to me. I, 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 all I think is about my kings and my nation. I don't believe in God. The God ain't helping me, so I come to my nation to help me, you know? And my, and my nation is like a God to me, you know? That's why I follow by this nation. That kind of loyalty comes at a high price. Gang members choose to dance with death. I've been through so much beef, so much shootouts, everything, gang violence, everything. I got shot right over here, right in this area right here. I got shot. People try to take me down, nobody can take me down. They try and try so much, but I'm still here living today with my brother today. I'm all dead late. Dead late. Dead late. It's a familiar story, one that this 33-year-old high-ranking gangbanger knows well. King Bulldog joined the Latin Kings at the age of 10. In this exclusive interview, he explains why he became a member. I grew up in an environment without a, a dad. I kind of took them as a role model. And 
seeing them in the streets all the time, throwing up signs and getting money and girls and this and that. That was something that I really wanted to to get involved with. King Bulldog figured out quickly that the more violent he became, the more power he gained within the nation. Before long, violence became second nature. You actually start getting used to it. Used to blood splatting at you, blood splatting out, seeing blood pour on the floor and be a part of the gang, that's what you see, you see blood, nothing but blood. Eventually, the blood spilled would be that of his own family. In the early 90s, the Latin Kings were at war with their rivals, the Bloods, over territory in the Bronx. King Bulldog, then a high-ranking leader, saw red, literally, every time he saw someone wearing the crimson color of the Bloods. I felt that every person that I see with a red on, I have to attack. That hatred was mutual. In the fall of 1994, King Bulldog was holding his two-year-old son on the streets when a suspicious vehicle pulled up. The windows rolled down and members of the Bloods opened fire. King Bulldog survived. His son did not. My son got shot three times in the head. And that was my first, first child. But it would turn out that rival gang members weren't the only ones who wanted King Bulldog dead. One day, Bulldog was driving through the Bronx when he noticed three vehicles close behind. When he came to a stoplight, the car surrounded him. Initially, he was relieved to see they were wearing the black and gold colors of the Latin Kings, his brothers. I got out to salute them, and instead of getting a salute, they caught me with a razor and stabbed me in my heart, almost dying because they wanted me dead. The attack was an attempted coup. King Bulldog held the third highest position in the nation, and some ambitious members wanted him out of the way. Because they feel that, you know, you're worth too much. You know too much. So we might as well just take him out and take his position. That's the way it is. King Bulldog learned an important lesson of gang life. Don't trust anybody, not even your so-called family. You know, they always say that, um, you know, your brother's your worst enemy. Why? Because he's your closest one to you. This brother against brother bloodshed goes against everything the Latin Kings claim to stand for. Yet the underbelly of fratricide has always been part of the gang. And in 1993, it reached a new level, exploding into a series of violent crimes that baffled authorities and almost destroyed the New York Latin King nation. It began with one of the most notorious killings in the gang's bloody history. The murder of William Cartagena, AKA King Lil Man. It was in September 1993 that his mutilated corpse was discovered in a Bronx tenement by New York City firefighters. Sergeant Lou Savelli patrolled these streets for the New York City Police Department's gang unit. William Cartagena was strangled and killed in this building. He was brought here into a bathtub. His hands and his feet were cut off and his head. His Latin King tattoo was cut off by members of his own gang. The killers set fire to the corpse before leaving the scene. Just four days later, the Latin Kings plotted another murder. This one in Brooklyn. Their intended victim was Margie Carteron, a member of the King's sister gang, the Latin Queens. Margie's homies had planned to shoot her, but were unable to break into her apartment. So they decided to burn down the entire building with her neighbors inside. Richard Zabel prosecuted the case for the U.S. Attorney's Office. They got up to where her door was, poured gasoline under the door and on the door and all around the walls and the hallway there to burn her to death. Queen Margie escaped uninjured, but two of her neighbors weren't so lucky, their skin permanently disfigured by the flames. Just six weeks later on October 30th, the king struck yet again. Five gang members armed to the teeth approached a Brooklyn apartment building where a Halloween party was in full swing. Their target was high-ranking gang member Rafael Gonzalez, known to the nation as King Mousy. They had gone up the stairs to where the party was. I mean, there were a lot of people walking around and a lot of noise. And they knocked on the door, and um, the door was opened, and they just started shooting. 
one innocent bystander was gunned down, but King Malsey escaped and was never heard from again. It was the third major crime within weeks, and New York authorities like Deanna Rodriguez were getting suspicious. Then they noticed a pattern. All the people that were committing these crimes were like dressed alike. They were wearing gold and black. The suspects were wearing the gang colors of the Latin Kings. As authorities dug deeper, it seemed likely that one man was behind it all. A lifelong criminal and the leader of the New York Latin King Nation. A man known simply by the name King Blood. He turned out to be one of the most ruthless and bloodthirsty killers that history will ever know. 1993, New York City. For months, gang unit detectives had tracked a series of brutal crimes, all believed to have been committed by one gang, the Latin Kings. Authorities soon noticed something curious. It appeared the Latin Kings weren't targeting their enemies. They were going after their own with a vengeance. They took New York by storm, bodies being dismembered, bodies being burned. Things of this nature, the vicious slashes, the vicious stabbings. The more they investigated, the more police suspected there was one mastermind behind the carnage. A man named Luis Felipe, AKA King Blood. Felipe was a career criminal who had joined the Latin Kings over a decade earlier in Chicago, the city where it all began. It was the 1940s, during the Second World War, and the demand for industrial workers was high. The government eased immigration restrictions, and thousands of Latinos poured into Chicago looking for work. Other ethnic groups resented the competition. There was a rejection, uh, more or less, by uh, Irish and Italian communities in Chicago. You're not from here. Get out. The Hispanic community responded by banding together. They formed a group they called the Latin Kings. Each member created his own name, putting the title of King in front. It gave members a feeling of self-worth and helped them rise above the racism they faced. Adding a title of royalty, I'm a king, in a place that they told me that because I'm a Latino, I'm nobody. So it's another way of fighting back this issue of the names. The Latin Kings also developed a written manifesto, which was revered like the Bible. It gave detailed lessons on how members should behave. Lessons included respecting your brothers, showing loyalty to the nation, and seeking wisdom through the manifesto. These lessons were dubbed Kingism. For decades, the Latin Kings were a constructive force in the Hispanic community most of which was comprised of hardworking, upstanding citizens. But by the 1980s, some Latin kings began taking advantage of the group's positive image, using it as a front to sell drugs and weapons. Those members soon landed in prison, where they recruited others. It's like a spinning door. You know, people are going in, people are coming out. So for every one Latin king that's going into prison, there's like seven more coming out. Before long, the Latin Kings transitioned into a criminal organization. It was around this time that a Cuban criminal named Luis Felipe arrived in Chicago. As the Latin Kings would soon learn, Felipe was their kind of man. Luis Felipe was born in Cuba on May 11, 1961, to a prostitute mother and a father whom he never met. In the impoverished barrios of Havana, Felipe started a life of crime. As a teenager, he was arrested for attempted murder and sent to prison for 10 years. As Felipe sat in his cell, Cuba was in a state of rebellion. The economy was in shambles, and many Cubans were unhappy with their president, Fidel Castro. In 1980, Castro announced that anyone who wanted to leave Cuba was free to do so. This included opening up the prisons and freeing some of Cuba's most cold-blooded criminals. A mass exodus of more than 100,000 refugees fled to the United States in what was called the Marielle Boat Lift. The kind of, the more sort of reprobate, uh, the more deviant uh, of the Cuban society and you know, basically uh, gave them rafts and boats and sent them on their way to Miami. 
Luis Felipe was among them. From Miami, he made his way to Chicago, where he continued his criminal behavior. I was a dolphin, used to live in boxes up in Chicago. He was a junkie, but he always had a gun on him because the way he survived in the jungle was to actually go out there and rob people to support his habits. Soon after arriving, Felipe came into contact with the Latin Kings, who were deeply involved in Chicago's drug trade. Felipe joined the gang, taking on the name King Blood. His willingness to sell drugs and commit acts of violence made him a star among his new brothers. They created a monster out of him. Then he started killing people out there, for just for the fun of it. Chicago police caught wind of Felipe's activities. So in 1981, Felipe fled the Midwest and moved to the South Bronx in New York City. One year later, New York police arrested Felipe for shooting and killing his girlfriend during what he called a drunken accident. He was sentenced to nine years and sent to Collins Correctional Facility in upstate New York. The prison was a hotbed of racial violence. American inmates were running the prisons, and from an inmate perspective, there must have been a real issue for safety for Latinos. In there, you gotta have someone, because if not, they'll either rape you or kill you, you know, take everything you, you have. Felipe decided to unify his Latino brothers. On January 20th, 1986, he created the New York chapter of the Latin Kings. King Blood adopted the Chicago chapter's five-point crown, which symbolized the nation and represented the five main principles of kingism. Respect, honesty, unity, knowledge, and love. If you broke one of the principles, you broke them all. If I lie to you, I'm breaking honesty. If I'm not honest with you, that means I don't respect you. If I don't respect you, that means I'm not being united with you and the rest of my brothers. If I'm not being united with you, that means I don't have enough knowledge to know that I'm supposed to have all my five points in my crown. And if I don't have those five points, then I have no love whatsoever which for you. Amor de Rey, or King's Love, became the rallying call of the nation. Its ranks grew quickly. By 1993, membership had ballooned to the thousands as kings left the prison system and began recruiting on the streets. People want to be part of something that they see as a movement and not just a gang. And that's what the Latin kings were on the surface. But below the surface, the kings were causing mayhem. From his prison cell in upstate New York, King Blood ran the gang with an iron fist. He had the respect of inmates and guards alike. The man was untouchable. No one would be able to get near him. He used to always walk with 20 members and the police moving to the side for you. And if you get near him, no matter who you are, you're still going to get ripped or beat up, no matter what you are. Felipe's method of sending his orders to the outside was shockingly simple. He used handwritten letters. Felipe appreciated the power of the written word because he is not personally in touch with so many of these Latin kings. So he needs a way, a structure, a method of communicating, instilling order, respect, rules. And he ends up doing that by the written word. When Felipe wanted someone taken out, he wrote it down. Problem was, over time, Felipe found more and more reasons to have people killed. And his brazen form of communication would come back to haunt him. When you're on top and you have that much power, you don't think about the consequences. In 1986, from his prison cell in upstate New York, Luis Felipe started the New York chapter of the Latin Kings. Now, two decades later, that small prison gang is a street army of more than 5,000 members. That's our godfather, King Blood. He taught us everything we know, prayers, our lessons, everything. He taught us, he taught us the real, true meaning of kingism. Joining the gang means swearing allegiance to the nation's rules and regulations for life. A king is a king for life. He dies under those colors. Initiation into the Latin Kings can be as simple as being born into the gang, or as vicious as taking a serious beating. King Bulldog has been a member of the Latin Kings for over 20 years. When he joined the gang at the age of 10, he had to survive a beating from a 20-man line. 
That means that um, you start from one person to the end with bats and sticks. If you make it, then you survive. If you don't make it, then one, you don't be part of it, and two, you be somewhere in the desert. And I went through the line, I made it. Once they make the gang, all members are expected to carry out missions. Missions could be anything from scabbing or carrying drugs from one state to another or going out there and um, you know doing what they wanted you to do. Could have been different things. You have to do it. Because that's the only way you could become someone. Latin queens, who are considered equal members within the nation, are often given missions like smuggling drugs and weapons or prostituting themselves to provide money for the gang. This interrogation footage of a Latin king describes one assignment. We have a queen who lives in Brooklyn who goes out once a month to Addison, Pennsylvania to transport guns and drugs. The way she transported it is through a book bag with a teddy bear. The teddy bear is shaped as a book bag and is put in the bear's head. But a queen's most important function is to preserve the future of the Latin king nation. Latin kings are taught that we don't die, we multiply. A Latin queen, who she gives birth to, that's a future king or queen to the nation. That's what's gonna keep this nation growing. Keeping that nation strong was Luis Felipe's goal, and organization was the key. Known as King Blood, Felipe was the supreme crown authority of the nation, or Inca, a name taken from the ancient South American warrior culture. Underneath him were different tribes representing all five New York boroughs. Each tribe had a five-man leadership structure consisting of the first crown or president, second crown or vice president, third crown or warlord, fourth crown or counselor, and fifth crown or treasurer. In order to move up in the ranks, members had to prove themselves, often through acts of extreme violence. At 10 years old, King Bulldog already knew what was necessary. I need to do things that no other 10 year old will be or have the heart to do. I went on missions and started uh, following my orders. This gang took over my heart. I would attack even my own mother. He soon graduated from beating with his fists to stabbing. Well, the first time was tough, then I got used to it. Then I started, uh, you know, stabbing people and for the fun of it, but just to see him bleed. I used to love stabbing people, beating up on people. Eventually, King Bulldog rose to the third crown, or warlord, the most violent position in the gang. The crown is the ones that makes decisions as far as weapons and war, and who's going to be attacked that day, or who's going to be attacked that next day. Brandon Corey, who joined the gang when he was 18, also rose to third crown status in his tribe. The power was addictive. It was like a high. Just knowing you could snap your fingers in a half hour, you have 500 people standing in one corner just waiting to, to see what you want, want them to do next. Once a month, every Latin King member from the entire state of New York joins together for a universal. Yeah, we go to Universal every month. That's where all the boys get together. We talk about our situations. We go at one people nation. Instead of having the daily news, you know, we had the Universal. Individual tribes also hold meetings where dues are paid. The money is used to help out members in need, but it's also used for illegal activities, like buying guns. Tribal leaders use brutal tactics to keep members in line. Brandon Corey recalls a meeting where one member showed up five minutes late. The top dog, he was serious, he meant business, so, hey, come here, you, know, you, know, you was five minutes late, it's okay, just stand here in the middle of the circle for one minute. The guy didn't walk out that circle, he was carried out. You know, he was stabbed up, they stabbed him up, and from that day forward, I was never late to a meeting. Just like the army, the Latin kings have a uniform, wearing the colors black, gold, and red. Gold represents the sun. Black stands for the past and remembering their history of oppression. Red was to represent the blood that Latin kings have shed for the cause of the crown of the nation, meaning the blood that I shed for what I believe in in kingism. 
Latin kings wear these colors like a badge of honor, unless they're trying to shake the cops. Then as gang unit detective P.J. O'Rourke illustrates, they have subtle means of showing allegiance. When they're gonna tell you this is a religious article, well, it is a cross, but the significance here is this was made to represent the Latin King nation, the black and gold on the cross with the black string. Black and gold bandana, this is traditionally what you're gonna see on the street. We had information that when they had the bandana tucked into the belt line like this, they were using the bandana to conceal the butt of a firearm. Like most gangs, kings also represent their allegiance through elaborate tattoos. A truly committed king will permanently mark his body with the five-point crown or ADR, a more deray. This right here, the crown, the line, and the shield. The shield protects my body, my mind, and spirit. The five-point crown and everything. Black and gold never fold. So if I got a, a, a tattoo of a, of a crown, that's my way of telling you, this is forever. This is my crown. This is my nation. Kings that are in prison with no tattoo parlor get creative when it comes to body ink. We create our own needles with pens. They take a machine and, like, a, let's just say a haircut machine. They take the mortar out, they put a pen on it, and it bounces up and down. This is the, the machine they use to do it. Uh, it's a small motor in here. These are all taken from pieces, parts found in the jail. They fasten this together hook these wires up to it, hook these two wires up to a power source in the wall, dip the needle into ink, and away they go. Signing is a traditional way to show allegiance among most gangs. In the Latin King Nation, some signs are general greetings, while others represent rankings within the gang. This means I'm willing to die for you. This is a three-point crown, which is love, honor, and respect that you give your brothers. But back in the early 90s, the most important sign a Latin king could throw was the salute to king blood. The way you salute blood is throwing up your crown of respect and um, actually getting your right knee up and your left knee down on the floor. And that's the only way you could salute the man. If not, he would have been dead. Even from his prison cell, king blood's authority was absolute. Through letters, he used his own coded language to order punishments for members who disrespected him, like a BOS. When a member is targeted for BOS, any member of that tribe sees him, they're supposed to attack him. And that beating could be a mild beating to a severe beating, sometimes has led to death. More serious crimes against the nation, like ratting or stealing money, could be met with a TOS. If you were suspected of being a snitch, or if you were suspected of trying to form your own set of Latin kings, or to betray Luis Felipe, and you was feeling it. Problem was, by 1993, King Blood saw a traitor behind every corner. He was drunk with power, and ordering hits on anyone he perceived as a threat, even high-ranking members. Violence is seductive. Um, it's, um, you know, people get into it. It's, it's like a drug. It's very difficult to turn off, and, and it's, uh, it's um, sort of bloodlust. On July 15, 1994, near the George Washington Bridge, gang member King Russ was shot in the head for not standing by his brothers during an altercation with a drug dealer. Six months later, King JR was shot and killed for not showing allegiance to King Blood. Ten days later, the body of King Light was found in front of this building in Spanish Harlem. His offense? Kissing the girlfriend of a second crown leader. The nation was turning on itself, and it seemed that almost any gang was safer than the Latin Kings. Bloods, Crips, or every Brotherhood, I must have one of them. A Latin King learns that your worst enemy is a Latin King. New York City, 1993. The Latin Kings were in turmoil as founder Luis Felipe, AKA King Blood, kicked off at in-house bloodletting. Anyone he perceived as a threat was killed and the corpses were piling up. Everybody wanted to be a chief. Nobody wanted to be an Indian. It's always a power struggle. At first, New York police were baffled at what seemed to be a spike in random crimes but then they learn of a single source that connected them all, 
the writings of King Blood. Felipe was serving a nine-year sentence in upstate New York for murdering an ex-girlfriend. But from behind bars, he sent letters to his closest associates on the outside. Coded letters that contained execution orders. But authorities figured out King Blood's system and began secretly copying thousands of his letters. In the fall of 1993, they began linking Felipe to dozens of crimes, including three against his own nation. The first was the murder of William Lil Man Cartagena. Felipe's letters show he was angry over Lil Man's failure to kill a fellow gang member. Felipe also suspected Lil Man was skimming money from the nation. In the scheme of things, we're not talking about thousands of dollars. Maybe we're talking about hundreds of dollars. Maybe. In a letter dated August 4th, 1993, Felipe wrote to his second crown, Hey, number two, make that bitch low man feel it for you and me. Slow burn. One month later, on September 5th, Lil Man was lured by his homies into this Bronx apartment building. He had no idea he was about to be murdered. It's a technique the kings call sleeping. Once inside the apartment, the posse of kings tied Lil Man to a chair and stripped him down to his underwear. Federal attorneys Richard Zabel and Stephen Cohen prosecuted the case. The king said, I'll yoke him, meaning I'll strangle him. And some of the other Latin kings held little man's feet when he started kicking. There's then a discussion about whether or not he's dead. And they decide to take a belt and loop the belt around his neck and strangle him that way. And so then in turn, they each almost ritualistically tug on the belt to participate in the murder. The kings untied the lifeless body from the chair and brought it into the bathroom. There, the carnage continued. They loop him up by the feet around the shower head, um, and they, at that point, slit his neck um, and allow the blood to drain out of the body. The kings needed proof of the murder to show their superiors. They decided to use an electric turkey carving knife to cut off Lil Man's head and hands. They also sliced off the tattoo on his right arm. Lil Man was out of the picture, but now King Blood had yet another problem. He feared that Lil Man's girlfriend, Margie Carteron, knew too much about the gang's inner workings. In a letter dated August 8th, King Blood wrote, I hope by the time this letter arrives, our mutual problem with Lil Man and Margie are already resolved. But remember that things must be done with brains and never leave loose ends. A group of assassins took action. They tried to break into this Brooklyn apartment building where Margie lived to shoot her. When they couldn't get in, they decided to burn down the entire building. It did not end up uh, killing Margie Carter, who was there at the time. But uh, the fire went up into another apartment and uh, burned uh, some innocent people. But King Blood could care less about innocent bystanders as his bloodbath raged on. King Mousley was a high-ranking gang member in the same Brooklyn tribe as Margie Carteron. He was starting to gain a following. Felipe's letters reveal that Mousley was in the crosshairs for adding some of his own lessons to the Latin King Manifesto. It was jealousy or envy or, you know, who is he? Look, he's forming his own little set within the set. Let's, let's stop that right now. All right, we'll make an example out of you. That's the first and last time you do that. On September 29th, 1993, King Blood wrote to his second crown, please get that sucker. As long as that punk mousy is alive, we are gonna have problems. A month later, a Latin King hit squad learned Mousy would be at a Halloween party in Brooklyn. They opened fire on the revelers, killing an innocent man. The Kings fled, passing Mousy on their way out. One of the Latin Kings saw Mousy coming up the stairs, and as he ran by him, he said, Mousy, and Mousy turned his head to look at him, and he shot Mousy on the stairs. King Mousy was injured, but managed to escape with his life. 
King Blood kept sending out his ruthless orders, and the executions continued. He had no idea that authorities were compiling all of his correspondence, more than 20,000 pages of it. By 1994, the government had amassed a virtual blueprint of King Blood's crimes. I think all of us were just shocked at the level of violence. You just looked at this and said, you know, we've got to stop these people. In 1994, federal prosecutors were compiling a case against New York City Latin King founder Luis Felipe, also known as King Blood. They had amassed more than 20,000 pages of personal letters to his associates, many giving orders for murder. It was up to prosecutors to connect the dots. Those letters would reflect King Blood's orders to the Latin King nation. He would say, I want a TOS on this person. We would have learned that that person had been killed and we would track it back, you know, to how that happened. Faced with a stockpile of damning evidence, many of Felipe's most trusted associates flipped, choosing to testify against their leader in exchange for shorter prison sentences. Once you were able to put together people who understood what was going on in the street with people who knew the letters, more than any case I've ever seen, you suddenly had a very powerful federal case. On October 29th, 1996, the trial of King Blood began. Luis Felipe was charged with 11 counts of murder, including the gruesome mutilation of William Lowman Cartagena. Hundreds of Latin kings showed up to support their leader. Almost the entire audience of the courtroom was really just a sea of black and gold colors, you know, that they're the colors of the Latin kings. After a month-long trial, Felipe was found guilty of all charges. The judge sentenced King Blood to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The first 45 years were to be served in solitary confinement, allowing absolutely no contact with the outside world. For the first time, the New York Latin Kings were without their infamous leader. The judge silenced the voice of the Latin Kings in that sentence, which was the right thing to do. You will not be able to order another murder, you will not be able to hurt anyone else on the street, nor will they be able to come and hear your words or talk to you. It wasn't long before the Latin Kings ordained a new Inca or leader, a charismatic 29-year-old named Antonio Fernandez. Fernandez was known as King Tone, a name given to him by none other than King Blood. Luis Felipe say, you're gonna be the person who is gonna give the correct tone, okay, like music. You get the, the perfect tone to this Latino organization and the mistakes that I commit, I do, you don't do that. You bring the organization into another level. King Tone set out to do just that. He began yeah, preaching against the violent ways of the Latin Kings and encouraged gang members to develop a new image. I pray that this nation learns from its mistakes. We pray that whatever sentence is handed down to poet, that you protect him and his wife and his children. He beat them on sight and uh, terminations on sight. He changed that around because he felt that no brother should be touched, no brother should be hurt. He starts to talk a different talk and walk a different walk. He starts to look at the lessons of the Latin Kings, you know, standing up for yourself and, and building a new community and taking on the man and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And he starts to develop a new breed of Latin Kings and Queens. King Tone loved the spotlight and used the media to change the public perception of the nation. And I'll promise to help you keep yours alive, and then we'll save the community. Amor de Rey. Soon, his message of empowerment spread among the Latin kings of New York. But law enforcement was suspicious. Murder rates among the kings were dropping, but otherwise, it was gang business as usual. And according to a lot of the informants that we developed and other people within the gang that we talked to, the Latin Kings were full of 
that it wasn't about a brotherhood. It was about killing people and robbing people and making money and stealing and drug dealing. That was just propaganda they put out there to try to draw members in. The police and the FBI launched a 19-month undercover investigation. They soon found evidence linking gang members to murder for hire, firearm and drug trafficking, and other crimes. The Latin Kings were still up to their old tricks. On May 14, 1998, authorities went after the gang once again. Police arrested over 90 Latin Kings, including this man who felt deceived by King Tone. Do you feel he has betrayed a lot of brothers? I feel he betrayed a lot of brothers. I feel he took advantage of a lot of brothers. He manipulated a lot of brothers. A lot of brothers are in jail because of Tony. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, I don't want none of my people selling drugs or having guns or fighting. And then a couple of months later, I'm indicted for drugs. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a two-faced. I'm a liar. King Tone was arrested for conspiring to traffic in heroin and cocaine. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. He pled guilty because he knew they got him. And really, he should go down in history as being one of the greatest con men of our generation. Today, the Latin kings are still reeling from King Tone's arrest. They are disorganized and without a leader. And once again, they are at each other's throats. There's internal strife again. There's again the battle for supremacy. There is again the battle of which tribe will, will born the new Inca. And so what we do see is a lot of in-house fighting. Even so, recruitment is on the rise, especially with so-called Peewee Kings. Peewee Kings are eight years old, nine years old, seven years old, who are being utilized to carry drugs, the ones that will carry the guns, who are taught how to commit acts of violence against their purported enemies and each other. The little kids, they're the princes and queens of this tribe. They, what we teach them, they grow and they, they become us. They become us smart and wise like us. Many believe that it's just a matter of time until the Latin Kings make a comeback. The guys that we arrested and the people who were put in jail in the 90s that didn't receive life sentences are starting to come home. And they're going to start it up again. And I think a lot of what we're going to see now is the resurrection. All our brothers come out of jail, we right here, we right there. We got their back 24-7. They're in prison, they're in their little bed real quick. But when they come out, we're here with them. We will have their back 100%, 24-7. Black and gold never falls right I'm there. on that right. I'm on that right. 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 Today, King Bulldog says he is retired from the Latin Kings, though he remains in contact with them. He spends his time trying to dissuade kids from joining gangs. I basically am trying to make a change out of them still, because I know there's certain members, certain kids in there that has good in them, that they don't know what they're getting into. Brandon Corey is also using his experience for good. While serving a three-year prison sentence, he wrote a book about life in the nation. He now lives under his own principles. You don't have to wear yellow and black and a yellow bandana around your neck to say you're a king. If you're working, you're taking care of your wife and kids, and you're doing the right thing, that alone makes you a Latin king. Even so, for any New York Latin king, the past is prologue. I think the Latin kings are always going to be around because there's always going to be young ones. They're going to grow up and they're going to teach their young ones. It's always going to be there. We're going to be in the future. We was in the past, we're in the present, and now we're going to be in the future. Yeah, there is no it. stop to this, you know what I mean? It's always going to be here forever. It's never a stop thing. I'll see you later now. This is never am. It's always going to be around forever and ever, you know what I mean? Every day that I walk out my house, I need to look behind me. And to this day, I still look behind me because you never know.